The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a tourist asking for information at a tourist office. First, you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, how can I help you? Um, hello. Is it possible to book a bus tour of the city here? Of course, sir. When would you like to take the tour? There are tours in the morning, afternoon and evening. Sometimes it's nice to see the city at night with the buildings lit up. We'll be going out for dinner tonight, so we prefer to go this afternoon. Oh, and it's for two people. Right. Now, I just need some details. Can you give me the names of the two people, please? Yes. Susan Field and James Carter. Susan Field and James... Sorry, can you spell your surname for me, please? It's Carter. C-A-R-T-E-R. -E Thank you. And can I have a contact telephone number? Why do you need one? Just in case we have to cancel the tour and need to contact you. I see. Well, my mobile number is 07988-636-197. That's 07988-636-197. Now, can you also tell me which hotel you're staying at? The Crest Hotel. Oh, uh, no, sorry. That's the hotel we're staying in next week. It's the Riverside Hotel. Oh, the Riverside is a lovely hotel. Are you enjoying your stay? Yes, we are, very much. We definitely recommend it to others. Oh, I am glad. Now, I can book you on the tour at 4pm. Would that suit you? Alternatively, there is one at 2. 2 would be better for us, please. Right. That's booked for you, sir. Two people at 2pm today, August the 14th. You pay the bus driver when you get on, and it's £4 per person. Thank you very much. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Can I also ask you about the museum in the main square? I was reading about it in my guidebook and was shocked to see that the entrance price is £10. Why does it cost so much? Well, the museum has the largest collection of Latin American art in Europe. People come from all over the world to see it. But that's not the reason why it's so expensive to get in. You see, the building is very old and it needs repairs. The £10 ticket cost will go towards repairing the roof and the walls. I see. Well, I suppose it's worth paying £10 to see the collection. Yes, I think so too. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, there is. I was wondering if you knew of any good restaurants in the area. Well, there are a few restaurants near the harbour and a couple on the beach, which are nice. The problem is that the smell of the fish market is quite strong down there. Hmm, I don't think my girlfriend would be very pleased. I know what you mean. It's not very romantic, is it? <laughs> my advice would be to go to the next town. It's bigger and the restaurant selection is wider. You can get there by taxi and it only takes about ten minutes. The town is quite picturesque. Is it for a special occasion?
Yes, it's my girlfriend's birthday, so I'd like to go somewhere special. Uh, do you know any of these restaurants well enough to tell me about them? Well, I know about a few of them, and there are pictures in this leaflet here. Oh, this one here is lovely, the Bellevue, and it's extremely popular. It has a famous chef, so it's not cheap, but the standard of the food is very high. It's right by the sea, and there are wonderful views if you get a good table. Then there's the Lighthouse Cafe. You can see the picture here, which isn't really a cafe at all. In fact, it's a great restaurant, and a lot of TV celebrities and actors eat there. The place has been going for over a hundred years. It's quite an institution around here.、Mm, I'm not sure about those two. They sound too expensive to me. I was thinking of somewhere small, not too upmarket, but with good food. In that case, what about Harvey's? The same family has run this restaurant for over a century, and it's reasonably priced and really popular with local people. Oh, and there's another family-run restaurant, Stonecroft House. New owners took over a month ago, and they're getting good reviews. There's a new chef there, and the food is meant to be very good. This leaflet has the contact details for all the restaurants, so you can just call them if you'd like to book a table. Great, thanks. You've been very helpful. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a presenter interviewing a student on a radio show. The student is talking about her experiences of mountain climbing. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Welcome back to BURS, your independent student union radio station. We're looking at some of the incredible feats one or two of you have been up to during your summer break. I'm with Catherine, who's going to tell us about her successful climb of one of the most iconic mountains in the world, Mont Blanc. Catherine, tell us a little about your achievement. Well, actually, it was the second time I've reached the summit. The first was in 2007, the year before I came to university. People are often surprised to hear how popular the mountain is with climbers. I've read somewhere over 30,000 people attempt the climb each year, and around 200 people a day summit during the summer season. So it's very crowded up there. Unfortunately, it's also potentially very dangerous. In July 2007, the month before I did my first climb, the death toll reached 30, mainly due to bad weather conditions. The sheer number of people can cause falling rocks, which only adds to the danger. Before you hear more of the interview, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions fifteen to twenty. 
So why did you do the same climb twice? And was it easier the second time around? <laughs> In many ways, they were totally different experiences. The first time I went as part of an organised group, there were about twenty of us, and we took four days to summit. It was much more of a sociable experience compared to the second climb. This year, I decided to go solo with just one overnight stop. I felt more confident having already summited once, and I wanted to face the challenge of being in control. Actually, you're never really alone. There are other climbers and groups around all the time, but I suppose being alone made me feel more intrepid. The first climb was quite difficult, as the weather was very changeable. And we found ourselves climbing in very cold, windy conditions. We were in a group, so we offered each other encouragement, but it was still very difficult. The weather this time was wonderful. Plus, I also spent a few days beforehand in Chamonix and acclimatized myself more to the altitude. This certainly made it easier. You can achieve the same thing by climbing some of the smaller peaks in the area first, but I wanted a more leisurely start. It was fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Did your experiences on the first climb help you the second time around? I'm wondering if you have any useful advice for others planning on doing something similar. Well, because the climb's becoming so popular, I think people don't always give it the respect it deserves. And I'm not talking here about the physical condition you need to be in to take on a challenge like this, or having the right equipment. That goes without saying. I think what took me by surprise more than anything else was the extreme weather conditions, even in the summer. For those who want to summit in a single day or two, the climb will often start early in the morning, so you'll need to make sure you're wearing enough layers to protect yourself from the cold and wind. You'll be glad of this when you hit queues and find yourself standing around waiting to move on. Then, at the other extreme, around midday, you must make sure you're fully protected from the sun. Or you're likely to get very badly burnt. Whether you climb alone, in a group, or with a guide, that will depend on your own experience. But however you decide to go, it's essential that you take your time and get used to the altitude. Okay, many thanks for taking the time to come in and tell us all about it. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk about the yellow plaque scheme in Sydney. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Thank you for coming along to the Cultural Sydney talk. I'm going to start by telling you about the Yellow Plaque Scheme, which has been running in Sydney for over forty years and has been incredibly successful. When you're walking around the city, you'll see some buildings with a small round yellow plaque on them. If you take a closer look, you'll see the name and details of a famous person who lived in that very place. We have at present 130 plaques up in the city. The scheme has been great for tourism, but it was really started to raise awareness of the rich history of Sydney, both locally and nationally. And we think we've managed to do this. We also wanted to make people aware of the impressive list of important people who have lived in this city, and we've certainly achieved that. But that's not all. Although not 
part of our original aims, the scheme has also helped preserve some of the older and more important buildings in Sydney, because people now know that these buildings are a link to our past. Some of the buildings are actually over 180 years old, which for Australia is ancient. We actually think that this is where the scheme has achieved the most success, in raising the profile of our rich history. Of course, it has helped tourism, but not only that, locals also walk around looking at the plaques. It has been really wonderful in highlighting our past. Some people are quite surprised to see who has lived here. Take Errol Flynn, for example. He was married in Sydney. We are planning on putting more plaques up, and a common question is how can people nominate a figure to be put on a plaque? It's quite a simple process. Applications can be downloaded from our website. If you want to nominate someone for a plaque, you just need the person's name, where they lived, and you need three signatures to approve your application. Our panel then checks that all the data you've submitted is correct, and hopefully, within a year, a new plaque will be erected. But you can't nominate just anyone. A plaque can only be given to a person who is famous and has achieved something out of the ordinary like an important politician or world-record-breaking sportsman, for example. We aim to have 50 new plaques up within the next three years, and we have plenty of funding to do so. Our funding comes from three sources, the local council, community donations and the tourist board. Whereas in the past, the tourist board put in the majority of funding, now public donations count for 65% of all total funds. In fact, our funding is so healthy now, there are plans to expand the scheme. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. At the moment, we only have yellow plaques for all the famous people, but we are aiming to produce different coloured plaques so that people can do specific walks. For example, if they are interested in famous sports personalities, they can do a tour following the red plaques, the colour we are aiming to use for these people. We are looking at introducing grey, white and green plaques as well, we are thinking of using grey plaques to signify people who have done important work within the government and white plaques for those who have done good works in the community. Lastly, our green plaques we think will be very popular. These will be for painters and sculptors, leaving our yellow ones for writers, actors and other people of note. We do hope you enjoy looking at the plaques around the city. We have guidebooks on sale in the gift shop where you can find all the plaques. These are priced at $11.99. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk about work placements for psychology students. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. I'm here today to talk about the placement that's offered to all psychology students. As you all know, this takes place in the third year of the Psychology BSc. I'm here to explain a little about the placement and how the process works. A lot of preparations involved in getting these placements right, so you need to be thinking about this now. Students taking up a placement year benefit immensely from the experience. To find decent employment in the field of psychology, the chances are you'll need to undertake some form of postgraduate training, such as one of our master's courses. These courses invariably demand experience in the field you intend to study. So being able to gain this experience during your undergraduate degree is a great advantage. There's a lot to be gained from joining the scheme. Of course, it will help you identify the areas of psychology you may or may not be interested in. And you'll develop transferable skills such as problem solving, team working, communication skills. Skills that employers demand and that graduates often lack. Also remember that the placement will offer you networking opportunities to become acquainted with key players in your field. Many of our students who've completed a placement year take up a position with the same employer after graduation or after successfully completing postgraduate training. In fact, many of our students from previous years now hold influential positions in the police, the health service and the private sector as a direct result of their placements. The placement you choose will depend very much on your own area of interest. Those of you who have a particular interest in research can opt for a placement in a hospital unit here or abroad, working in areas of forensic and clinical psychology. A post here can be very rewarding and allows you to contribute to qualitative and quantitative research data and learn practical research skills you can use in your coursework. For those who prefer hands-on experience of working with patients, there are a wide range of options available. We have links with several charitable and public sector organizations that support stroke patients and people recovering from serious physical trauma, for example due to motoring or industrial accidents you'll have the opportunity to help them deal with long-term clinical treatment and pain management. There are several opportunities to work with addiction and rehabilitation units. The kind of experience you'll gain here can be very wide-ranging. For example, offering you the chance to observe group therapy and one-to-one -one counseling sessions for anxiety and anger management classes. Students are encouraged to give their reaction to sessions during regular team meetings which can often be of benefit to both the student and the organization. For those of you interested in the application of psychology and education, we have a number of students who take placements working with children with special educational needs. Students in the past have worked as teaching assistants and contributed to teacher training workshops. There's a lot more information about this on the website, including case studies written by some of our previous students. These will give you a much wider and richer picture of our placements. As I said earlier, you should already be giving this some serious thought. Our placement officer, Greg Smith, will be able to advise you about the organizations we have contacts with and we've worked with in the past. Once you've discussed the opportunities available, we ask you to contact the organization concerned to investigate potential positions and to arrange an interview. Your personal tutor will be able to help you with updating your CV and interview skills. During the enrollment process, you'll have been notified of the need to obtain a CRB check. In cases where you're working with vulnerable people, it's a legal requirement that you've had a Criminal Records Bureau check carried out. Without this, we won't be able to approve the placement. If you haven't yet arranged this, you must notify the placement officer of this during your first meeting. He'll give you the necessary paperwork to make your application. Once you have the certificate, please supply a photocopy to the placement officer. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you will now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Thank <laughs> you.